Ed, Claudia, welcome to the Guild of Dads podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming on to uh, speak with me today. Um, I've read through the uh, through the copy of the book that you sent me, your new book that's going to be coming out, The uh, Power of Discord, um, which delves into the uh, way in which we can form better relationships and how our um, experience of relationships is relationships are formed from our sort of early years um, and what I'm kind of quite excited about in today's conversation is um, having this conversation during this particular time in history just coming off of uh, lockdown and the virus pandemic and also a period of history where all of a sudden out of kind of nowhere there is kind of quite a lot of uh, polarization and and also um, anxiety and uh, discourse not maybe going on in the way that um, we would like it to be going on, but obviously life isn't always the way we would like it to be. Um, just tell me about uh, a little bit about um, the research that kind of underpins and the motivation behind the idea uh, for the book, The Power of Discord, Ed. I, I started doing this research when I began I began looking at the interactions of infants, young children, and their parents. And I was trying to understand um, what I saw as a fundamental question, which is what made for good relationships? What made for good parenting? And there were a lot of general statements that we had. You know, parents had to be sensitive, they had to be appropriate, or whatever. But the, the words, were very vague and often we would um, we would have to rely on clinical judgment. Oh, this is a good relationship. This is a problematic relationship. And I really wanted to understand in, in some sense the ingredients of what what went into it. And so the the approach I took was um, an approach where I was videotaping on, by the way, on reel-to-reel -reel tape, um, really old recording, videotaping interactions, face-to-face -face interactions between parents and their infants, uh, mothers, fathers. And we also looked at the interaction of strangers because we were thinking, well, maybe that'll tell us something about a good or a bad in interaction. Um, and I would take videotapes of them and the hypothesis that I had when we were first looking at them was that the interaction was uh, matching, it was synchronous, um, it was well-coordinated, all sorts of really wonderful words, um, that it was a, a well-choreographed dance between the parent and the infant. And what happened was when I looked at the data that we were getting. And we would code the behavior. We would code where the mother was looking, where the infant was looking, their facial expressions. Were they smiling? Were they making an angry or a sad face? Um, when I looked at that, what I could see was there certainly were periods of time that the parent and the infant were really attuned to one another and they were really coordinated with one another. But at the same time, they were lots of periods of time in which they were not coordinated, in which they were mismatching one another. Um, and in, in a general way, what we began to see was that matching, being coordinated, made up a, on average about a 30 30% 30 of the interaction. And the rest was what I now call mismatching. Mm -hmm. And so the question I was faced with was, why was there so much, or how was this discoordination resolved? And what was the implication? Of and that's when um, the idea of a repair came into place, that you get into a mismatching state, and then either the infant or, or the parent, but either one of them does something that repairs the interaction so that they get coordinated mm -hmm. again. So for me, it was, um, in a sense, a, a discovery. And it overthrew, for me, this hypothesis 
that I think a lot of people walk around with, uh, that interactions should always be smooth, they should always be coordinated, they should never have any negative affect in them, um, it should be a kind of perfect dance. And we were really not seeing a perfect dance. Mm. And in terms of your work, Claudia, I know that your view of things kind of changed as well because you were looking at, uh, through your experience, more of a kind of diagnostic model as to how to resolve the differences and the the, the uh, issues if you, that you were seeing in kind of um, in kind of toddlers and, and and in children, but that you're kind of you realised that there was a point where this kind of wasn't working in the way that you thought it that, that it should, and it wasn't certainly yielding the results that you thought it should, and taking a slightly different approach um, gave you some insight in this in this particular area as well. I wonder whether you could touch upon that. Um. Yes, as you say, I was raised very much in the medical model as a pediatrician, um, but my real passions lay in understanding, kind of similar to Ed, but from a, a totally different origin, like why we are the way we are, mm. you know, and how to help people develop in a healthy way from the beginning. So I came at it from a very different angle. Um, and I found that the questions being asked were, what is it and what do we do to fix it? Mm. Um, and this was really the sort of standard training in pediatrics. And I even had training in developmental and behavioral pediatrics. So I was in a sense subspecialized um, and I was in the right place at the right time. I was in a very busy pediatric practice. I was going to delivery rooms in the middle of the night, really immersed in, in families. Um, but these kinds of behavior management, uh, increasingly there were huge numbers of kids being referred for ADHD evaluation and, and increasingly bipolar disorder, very young children. And at the same time, I had the good fortune to start studying with uh, the Berkshire Psychoanalytic Institute. And that opened my mind to the ideas of people like Winnicott, who was a very big influence on my work, mm -hmm. uh, Peter Fonagy, and then to Ed's work. Um, and then I was opened up to this whole field of infant mental health. So not only did it change uh, what I did, it changed sort of how I understood what was happening. And then I was able to more purposefully do what, uh, what I had noticed uh, um, and kind of organize my thinking. And I have to say that it continues to evolve, like how I understand how people change. Um, I continue to kind of integrate new ways of understanding that. Mm -hmm. But that's mm. that was my way in. Mm. Mm. And as you began to kind of collaborate together, I know you've um, Ed. You there is the famous kind of still face experiment, which kind of radically altered your your view of how interactions between mother and child actually play out. What was the what was your kind of general thoughts before you actually did the still face uh, experiment? And your kind of conclusions after it, how? Because I know it did radically change, the, you know, the 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 perception of, as to how interactions took place from a one-sided to a two-sided uh, approach. The, the still face has uh, it changed my thinking initially uh, when when I first did it, and then it's continued to evolve, and um, certainly in in my work with Claudia, I've begun to see aspects of it that I hadn't seen before. But when I first did it, we had this, there was a general hypothesis out there, a general idea that infants weren't really social, that they couldn't participate in interactions. And that probably sounds really weird and strange to a lot of people listening now, because we see the infants as being reactive and taking in emotions and being responsive to emotion. But at the time that I, I was doing that, um, the infant was seen kind of as a blank slate. Maybe the, maybe the parent made the infant look like the infant was able to do something. Um, and so I, I, wanted, I wanted to show that, um, or my hypothesis was that in fact, infants were really active in the interaction. So I took that face-to-face -face paradigm in which, say, a mother is playing with an infant and they're engaging in 
the kind of social play most of us engage in with infants. And I tried to think of um, what could I do that would really show me that the infant was reacting to what the mother had, had been doing. Now, I had done a lot of statistical analyses and mathematics on it, which seemed to point in the direction that the infant was reactive. But um, in my training, I was trained to be an experimental. So I was trained, you know, if you can't show it experimentally, then you can't show it at all. And so I came up with this um, idea, which was a little like, um, you know, bring a hammer as a tool and that's all you're going to do. I just figured I'll stop the mother from interacting with the infant. And if the infant is really paying attention to her, if the infant is really responding to what she's doing, then the infant will show me something that indicates that in fact, they're reacting to what the mother is doing. And so from the very first infant that we saw, um, and um, th th that tape can actually be seen on the Netflix program Babies, because I had an old version of it and they managed to resurrect it. But from the very first baby that I ran, we saw what's now called the still face reaction. The, infant, the mother stops reacting. The baby does something like looks at her, maybe smiles, at her. maybe he reaches out to her. She doesn't respond. So he looks at her again, maybe a sidelong look. Um, maybe he makes a vocalization and maybe another smile, but typically that second smile is shorter and it's not, you know, it's not a full, really a full kind of face. And then the baby looks away. But the baby comes back to the mother and again tries to solicit her. And over time, what happens is that the baby's reaching out and trying to get the mother decreases. The infants begin to look sadder. They turn away more. They avert their gaze more. Some of the babies lose postural control. They'll mm -hmm. sort of slump down in their seat. And at the same time, they still pay attention to her and they still watch what she's doing. And so that was, a, for me at that time, it was a really clear visualization. It was a clear experiment that said, the babies are picking up on what the mother does. And now I think a lot of this comes out of the work with, with Claudia is following the still face, there's what, we call the reunion episode. We ask the mother to play again with the infant. And what you see there is when she re-engages the infant, there may be an, a little initial discord and disruption. Um, uh, if I can say it, the baby may be a little pissed off at her um, for not having reacted. But very quickly, they get back into the playful interaction mm -hmm. with one another. So with, with that, the still face became sort of an experimental model of the idea of matching when they're playing together. The still face, which is a big mismatch, and then a repair during the reunion episode. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly what Claudia has brought in terms of are working together is that there's a hopefulness in the still face and there's a hopefulness in the repair model that when we get back together again, we can, we can resume what we were doing before. Mm -hmm. um, so the paradigm for me has become more hopeful and the idea that with repairs of interaction, you gain hope and you gain trust in the other person. Mm. Mm. And it's interesting because I know that Claudia, you were able to apply the hypothesis and the mismatch and repair to a, a family that you had with a young uh, young man who had ADHD, and you could see how applying the uh, hypothesis and the and the and the skills that uh, 
Ed has just mentioned that it had a different a different effect to the you know the outcome and com- and completely flipped on its head the diagnostic model that you'd been working to previously. Yes, and it's interesting because I did like that work was maybe a decade before I started to work with Ed, but so then uh, really immersing myself in Ed's research and theories, I was able to gain a new understanding of of what had happened before. Um, so I really, you know, once I appreciated the the fundamental nature of this process of mismatch and repair, I suddenly saw it everywhere. And so in that interaction, what I understood as happening is that all the members of the family were having this basic misunderstanding of each other's perspective, and that was causing them to be very disconnected. And as we kind of, instead of just getting rid of the symptoms, we opened it up and said, you know, each tried to take the time to understand the other's perspective, first between the father and the son. um, And they had this moment of, going from mismatch to repair or misunderstanding to understanding. And that led to this real moment of growth in their relationship, which in turn let the mother and the father and their relationship open up their own misunderstanding. And it led to a a really uh, marked uh, moment of growth for the whole family that was very complicated. But it was uh, it's it, so I kind of retrofitted the model onto that clinical experience. Mm, mm. Um, and, and now it's like, you know, in everyday encounters, I do see this power of having and we, and we have so much of it now in mm. our world. Um, and that uh, when you get through a little moment like that, it, it's like it's it's very hopeful. It's sort of like you string a whole bunch of moments like that together and that's how you move forward in a hopeful way through life yeah yeah and it's really interesting for, uh, what you say on that because funnily enough i was talking to a, a gentleman called uh robert glover who is the author of um no more mr nice guy which is kind of a, like it's a very popular book amongst um amongst men and dads but we would he was my last podcast guest funnily enough yesterday and i was talking to him about the fact that um my wife and i what has happened in kind of our relationship is that we you know we've been married for like 20 years now we we've begin begun to notice kind of traits i've noticed traits that were in my father she's noticing traits that were that that are for, that are from my mother's side um and quite often those are traits that we don't always like to have and we have found a way to kind of without judgment and without kind of uh, criticism say to each other look um you know where that's coming from and uh, and this works kind of both ways and that has helped us uh, when i was reading your through your book i was like i was kind of getting light bulb moments because i'm thinking actually i can see where this is pl- where this kind of plays out um in the next generation and obviously us being parents ourselves we're thinking hang on a minute do we want this to go um intergenerationally between um our parents and us and then onto our on onto our pet onto our children or do we take using the um terms you use in the book do we kind of mismatch and repair it here and now so that we kind of break that chain does that make any sense well you know what's so interesting but we're both smiling um body and i because um you know we're, we're thinking about our own relationships and how we see the messiness and the repairs um, everywhere. Uh, certainly my my wife and I, who of course never have any discord, um, uh, most typically she'll invoke this kind of, um, we're getting a little messy here or we uh, need a little repair and a repair for her uh, in, a, in our discord is for me to say, oh, you're right, dear. you're absolutely right. Um, that that's the best way to do it. What's interesting about your repair is that you and your wife are still probably both doing some of those things that are intergenerational from your parents, but you now have a way of communicating about it that it takes out the the misunderstanding that 
she might have of you doing your father's thing or you might be doing of her thing. You still both may do it, but nonetheless, you have a sense of, oh, I know where this is coming from. And it's something we can just let go by or deal with. Um, but we don't necessarily have to resolve the particular things. It's we have to work, we're resolving it within the relationship. You found a new way to do a dance step around those mismatches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I was actually smiling for a different reason because I was thinking about the next generation and how we always find new ways to mess up our kids. You know, So mm -hmm. our parents may have messed us up in some way. Um, so we won't mess them up in the same way, but some other way. Um, and I think that, you know, what I really, I have two young adult children and really what I want for them is to feel that they can act on their world to make it better when things are problematic and that they can be in a relationship with another person and in the same way. And I feel like that come, grows out of the fact that with me, and their dad, my husband, we have navigated, you know, many, many very difficult moments over the course of their their development, and we continue to, you know, mm -hmm. it, it it takes different forms, but it all of that has been in the service of them now being out in the world in a way that they can, you know, just we in that old fashioned way that we refer to Freud that to be able to work and to love. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And. Then, and if, if I, I was just going to pick up on the point of, you know, we always find new ways to mess up our parenting or something like that. I think one of the things the, the research points to or our way of thinking is that the messing up is inevitable. And while it can be repaired, at the same time, there are costs that go with the messing up. Um, and you can't resolve them, can't resolve them. Um, you know, and if, if you think about some of the quality of parenting that we now talk about, like helicopter parents who are hovering all the time, or um, uh, the parents who do, what's that, Olympic game with the ice and- Curling. Big, curling, right. Curling parents who try to make everything smooth for their child. Um, one is you can't do it. You, you can't smooth out everything. Um, and the second thing is that the parents who are trying to do that are anxious about their child's ability to deal with something, or they're anxious about how the world is going to affect the child. And of course, the child reads the anxiety that the parent has and begins to feel like, oh, well, maybe I can't really deal with this. Maybe I'm not up for it. And so the messiness and the repairs builds in that feeling into the infant and then the child that, oh, I can deal with something going wrong. I can make it better. I can try to do it. I can persist and work at it. And I don't always need someone else to be the one, you know, repairing what's going on. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, I, I spoke with a lady called Jessica Leahy, who's written a book called The Gift of Failure. And she talks about this very uh, subject in, in, in her book in terms of allowing, ch allowing uh, children to fail and allowing them to make mistakes in order to kind of learn from it as a positive kind of learning experience. And I remember speaking to her and she said the number one thing that, parent that children tell her more than anything else is um uh, i'm not my brother i'm not my mum i'm not my dad i'm not my sister because what uh, has kind of happened is there's this kind of vic this this pr process where parents are kind of trying to vicariously live out their youth through their through their mm -hmm. children um and this coupled with this kind of perfectionist um uh you know, perfection maybe at one point was kind of seen as a kind of a virtue, but now it's almost seen as a kind of handicap perfectionism now because it's just 
it's so stifling and it's so overwhelming to so, so many people. And the expectation I think it puts on all of our relationships is that things should be perfect. We shouldn't ever argue. We shouldn't ever kind of um, not be happy with each other. Everything it, should be plain so. Think, think how freeing it is to say, oh, it's great, you're messing up. So now you can make things better. Yeah. Right, and you, and you can develop something new. Um, my absolutely brilliant seven-year-old grandson um, said in some conversation, I think we were talking about his baseball playing. He said, well, I don't want to be perfect because if, I, if I'm perfect already, then, then I won't get any better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love your story about, you know, I am, essentially it's I am me. And yeah. I think that, you know, as humans, humans have, are uniquely have our separate sense of self. And that sense of self actually emerges in that space of it's not you, it's uh, of, of mismatch and repair or what Winnicott would call the transitional space. And one of my absolute favorite stories from my clinical work was, I, uh, there was a mom who had a very fraught relationship with her own mother around eating. And so she then in turn was very, very anxious about her child's eating. And we, we worked on this for, you know, uh, maybe several months. And then we, the child was about three. Uh, and then we were having a little session with the child on the floor. And mom was telling a story about they were with the aunt. And she said, well, how come you would eat the grapes for Aunt Judy and not, and you wouldn't eat them for me? And the child said, I ate the grapes for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was such a victory, like that, that tremendous sense of, of, of self and self-efficacy. Yeah, yeah. And it's incredible, this, the kind of stuff that kids do come out with. Um, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the things that I read in your book really resonated for me, for me on a personal level, just simply because my eldest daughter, who is coming up to 11 now, she was diagnosed with autism when she was six. So we've had that, um, we've been through that kind of process of, ah, oh, what's going on here? A, a behavior seems a little bit different to kind of actually getting a kind of name for it and actually kind of finding our way through how to interact with a child who's very different from our youngest child who is eight she's not got autism but our eldest child who's 11 does and it's the kind of the having those two different types of kind of uh, parenting uh, skills and attributes for each child individually I think it's always going to be the case because all, all children are different but they're very they're they're drastically different with an autistic child to a non-autistic child so and we've kind of very it's been very much a you know again going back to the uh the concept of mismatch and repair a lot of the things in your book really did resonate for me because a lot of what we've had to do kind of learning on the job has been all about mismatch and repair you know for the part for the past four to five years you know what i mean and sometimes it has been hard <laughs> yes yes yeah because you know, part of it is the the making sense of I imagine her behavior and what is it communicating is just what is uh, imagine mm. requires more effort. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think the thing is, is someone someone asked me once before what what's it like, and I kind of the description I kind of uh, used is like you know when you're driving a car, if you get in your car each time you get in your car, you know that. You change gear doing this and you steer doing this and you accelerate and decelerate with your feet. Have, being a parent of an autistic child is a bit like getting into the car each time and the controls moving each time you get into the car. Mm -hmm. So you're steering with your feet, you're accelerating with your hands and you're changing gear with your head. And then the next, uh -huh. day, the next day, all of the controls are changed. And that's kind of, that's, that's the easiest way can I, I can describe it to, to, to another person about parenting an autistic child that the, 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 not necessarily the, the controls isn't the right word, but the way in which you interact and the way in which you anticipate what their behavior is going to be like and all those kind of things, it's completely different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, when I th think about the, the, 
what you're talking about. The, another way to think about the challenge of it is that the typical way we all dance, or at least I dance, is get in sync for a little bit of time and then you get out of sync and then you get back into sync. Um, and, but there's a signaling and a communication that's saying, oh, we're, you know, let's do this step. And then I'm trying to do that step and maybe I make it and maybe I don't. Um, but one of the problems I think that, that occurs with children who have, you know, who are on the spectrum is that their signals, their signals are different than the ones that we sort of typically expect. Um, I think their timing is different. So maybe they're faster or slower on some kinds of things. And um, I think their ability on their side to read the signals that are coming in to them are more difficult. So it's a little like dancing with someone who's doing, you're doing a tango and kind of they're doing a waltz and it becomes much harder to get that coordination into place, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. um, but part of the frustration, but there's the feelings that come with that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the mismatch, we're talking about sort of these small little mismatches. Um, and those bring just a little bit of negative affect, a little bit of stress. We're not communicating well. We're, you know, and you may not even be aware of it. Yeah. But nonetheless, it's there. But when you get back together again, you feel connected and you feel positive affect for the person. And mm -hmm. you, you want it to work. But in between, there's, it's a little like the still face. There's all this negative stuff going on until you really get into the repair. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really big, I mean, it's a huge challenge to figure out, I mean, what you were saying, the idea that every day is a completely different way of being together. So you, you never, it becomes really difficult to establish that rhythm and to establish mm. that communication mm. system. Mm. Mm. But it can be done. And I think the, and I think the thing is, and, and as any parent of, I think, uh, an aut autistic child or a, any child where there is a, there is challenges in communication will tell you, it's the little things kind of, you know, the the, the smile or the laugh or the joke and mm -hmm. to, to parents of autistic children or um, that's one of the biggest things is often when the kid runs up to them and, and kind of just hugs them spontaneously because not that doesn't always happen with, autistic kids and I think it's uh yeah those little kind of those those little kind of wins that maybe other parents may will take for kind of granted because they just happen all the time they're like uh you know they're, they're like angels singing hallelujah moments do you know what I mean yeah so I think yeah. it's kind of almost like uh when you come back to the mismatch and repair it's like there's 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 the mismatch 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 and then a massive over repair and you're just like wow this is kind of bliss you know what I mean well, yeah, and I love the way, you know, the joy that you're capturing, you know, you know that's really what provides the, you know, the growth uh, mm. for us as parents and for your child is that energy that, and you almost wonder like the, the difficulty, you almost need to have that difficulty in order to attain that incredibly exhilarating joy of, of connecting like that. Yeah, yeah. And I love the way as, as well in your book, I mean, we talk about one of the, the three pillars of uh, Guild of Dads are vision, action and meaning. Um, and what we primarily do is help dads to kind of work out a vision for their future on which they can take action and kind of derive meaning. And people sort of say to me, well, what, do, what do you mean by meaning? And and, uh, and and what I say to people is that the meaning is is derived from the act of doing. It's the action. It's the journey that you're going on, and I think that speaks in volumes to what um, the work that you've done on the uh, Power of Discord book. And and you, t I know you touch upon meaning in terms of um, how children derive meaning from the behaviour of their um, their parents. 
but I, but I also think there is this underlying meaning in the actual journey that you are going through um, in the in the mismatch and repair process. You know what I mean? I think Claudia is waiting for me to say, <laughs> <Yeah. that. laughs> or are you just frozen? Um, one of one of my uh, one of my mentors was someone named um, Jerome Bruner, who was a cognitive psychologist absolutely brilliant brilliant person and he said something um that that mimics what you just said he he said humans all of us are and and he was very careful with the words he said we're makers of meaning we create meaning we actively engage in a process by which we're making meaning and some of that meaning comes out of doing things in the world. And some of it comes out of internal processes where we're thinking about things and making meaning that way. And some of it, for example, in infants who don't have really advanced, they don't have advanced cognitive processes and they don't have language, they're making meaning with a lot of bodily processes. Um, when they feel calm, and when they feel safe in the world. So their cardiac system is operating in a, in a regulated, calm kind of way. They're not, you know, they're not under stress. They're not getting all this cortisol flowing through them. So their meanings come out of these bodily somatic processes, but then as they get older, obviously, more and more meaning, more and more ways of making meaning come into this. Language, cognition, you know, and with adults we have, uh, you know, abstract thought, which mm -hmm. is, you know, can be a completely internal sort of um, process. A critical aspect of it, and I think, you know, parents, parents experience this all the time, is that I think those earlier processes, those earlier emotional and bodily processes, they're still operating in us at the same time as we have hopefully language and symbolic thought, whatever. Um, and in a way it relates to, I think, certainly in this country, the polarization of what's going on between different groups of people. Um, you know, politically, um, mm. where in some sense our cognitive processes have been kind of suspended and we're all reacting in these very in bodily kinds of ways with really strong emotions and they're very polarized. Um, and we, we're really emotionally experiencing the world in very, very different ways kinds of ways. And um, there's no in between. There's, you know, it's sort of like there's no messiness. It's either this way or this way, you know, it's one or the other. And it's rigid and inflexible. Uh, and it precludes, it makes, it makes having repairs really difficult. Mm. Because you, to get change, you have to have some of that messiness and some of that variability in place. If everything is rigidly organized, nothing changes. Mm. Um, you know, your thermostat never grows and develops. It, it either works or it fails. Um, you know, for people to create something new, you have to have, you have to have messiness. Mm. And, and while it seems like a very messy I think it's, in fact, a very rigidly organized period of time mm. for most people. Mm. That we're not open and we're not flexible. Yeah, and I think, and I think, sorry, Claudia, go on. No, I was just sort of putting while you're talking. I'm sort of putting all the pieces together of our current uh, situation about uh, how we make meaning uh, well before we have thoughts and language. So to expect new meanings and meaning of minds to occur purely on an intellectual level is really unlikely. 
you know, it's almost like we need to go uh, earlier developmentally. <laughs> and yeah. so I have this image. So we have the virus and we all have to be in our houses. And then we have this uh, crisis uh, that, that uh, really shines the spotlight on the horrific, certainly in this country, uh, you know, centuries of, of racism that we've not looked at. And suddenly people start moving together and being in streets together and their bodies literally moving together. And actually there was this incredible picture. I, you can see that I always try to put a hopeful cast on things that feel problem, really hopeless. There was this beautiful photo of this, um, uh, a large black man, he was protesting and there was a, a right wing protest protester who, I don't know if you saw this, who somehow got injured. So literally this black man, picked the, the white man up and was carrying him over his shoulder. And, and it, it's, it sort of symbolized to me that the only way we're gonna really make new meanings is actually to physically be doing something different with our bodies <laughs> um, in, in addition to uh, conversation and laws and, and things that happen on a more uh, intellectual level. Yeah, yeah. And I think the thing is, is um you know weaving together what you guys have, have just sort of described i think there is uh, again i i spoke to a um a previous guest a guy called andy torbett who's a big big outdoors man and we were talking about you know the um the the antidote that, na that a lot of people have found in nature um to as an antidote to the kind of lack of connection that they've had during isolation and lockdown and it's it's I do wonder whether or not the kind of what we're seeing with the with um, the kind of polarization and protests and stuff, there has been this kind of people have been starved of kind of connection and you know that kind of that 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 being part of a tribe and a and a, and a community, um, and all of a sudden this kind of event has happened, which is which has kind of triggered a very deeply biological need to be part of a tribe, and and. And this is kind of a very hardwired evolutionary thing that I've spoken to Robin Dunbar about in the past. That you know that, that people want to feel part of, you know, a a tribe or, or and there is you know there's I won't go into in, in in today's conversation because there are arguments against tribalism and for tribalism or whatever. But deep down, thousands of years ago, men um, and women survived in tribes, and it was and it was part and parcel of. Um, the furtherance of the, the human species and being able to survive and um, and all those kind of things and, and and I wonder whether this is kind of like a if you think of uh, lockdown as kind of stretching the elastic band of kind of connectivity and you've got this kind of snapback effect where all of a sudden lockdown's lifting you know there's this opportunity to go out in tribes and kind of voice how we feel and stuff and it, it's it's just a very interesting human dynamic going on at the moment I think. I, I think uh, a, another way to think about it, which doesn't necessarily invoke the kind of tribalism which can be problematic, mm. is that individuals need a sense of security and trust. And sometimes it's other people who provide the sense of security that you're not able to self-generate. Mm. Um, so for example, your outdoorsman who goes outside and becomes calm and feels like a connection with nature, the calming is something that he then brings back into his interactions. And so in a way he's more able to tolerate, oh, some more discord because he himself is calm. Um, infants, young children with their parents rely on their parents to give them that sense of um, security. People are, and I know Claudia has the same kind of experience. People are always asking me, well, what do you say to a two-year-old or a three-year-old about the COVID situation? And what I tell them to say is, everything's fine. We will take care of you. We're taking care of it. And you don't have to, and the fewer words you use, but just saying that 
to let them know that their world is being taken care of and their world is being taken care of by their parents. Because children have the sense that there are a lot of things out there that they can't really, you know, take on and deal with. And it's their parents who are going to protect them. That's what a two-year-old is. That's what a three-year-old is. It's actually probably in a way what we all need because we still have those basic systems that are responding to, you know, fearfulness or what's really going on now, what Claudia and I talk about a lot is uncertainty. Hmm. Uncertainty is really disorganized. And we are in a time of uncertainty. So I'm at home all the time. I feel I'm safe here, everything's fine, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't have that much discord with my wife. We're getting along, we're still, we're still buddies with each other, right? But the uncertainty of what's going on out there is just a constant grind on one's own ability to feel good about yourself. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think that it's, and, I, and, I, and what I've seen play out in terms of the kind of dad's communities that I'm part of is that P, it, it, the lockdown period has almost acted like a magnifying glass, if that makes any sense. So what it's doing is it's magnet. If there are negativities in relationships, it's magnifying them. If relationships, there are strong points in relationships, it's also magnifying them. Um, but what's interesting is because of that magnif- um, magnifying effect, if people make cha- have made changes during the lockdown period, often they're yielding quite quick and instantaneous results because of that kind of the magnifying effect of being in lockdown with with a close family member and that's just something i've kind of noticed and it's again it's interesting how it plays into this whole topic of discourse and you know the the mismatch and repair whether that is magnified during this kind of period of history that we're in right now i i i think very few of us you know, we all, you know, without saying it's like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, we all had a way of dancing with our partners and a, a way of being together. And then all of a sudden you're with the same person 24 hours a day. Some of the typical things that would help you to organize, like going to work or working on a particular project or whatever you were doing, um, you know, playing sports, that you had a schedule, all of that's come apart. So now there's a lot of disorganization going on at the same time that you're with this person where your dance together has been disrupted. So there's more disorganization there. And it becomes, as, as you're saying, it's a, it's a really hard challenge to kind of restructure things um, and to find, you know, to find that way to what you have to do is create a new way of being together. Mm. And when you're doing that, you know, those negative things come out and the positive things come out and um, you have to figure out new ways, new ways to take care of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also think that the whole situation has uh, sh- shown a spotlight on a lot of things that we were really not doing well. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think just a a very recent example and related to dads was um, I had a meeting with a bunch of professionals yesterday, one of whom does home visiting. And so they, their job is about going into people's homes. So obviously they don't do that anymore, at least not for now. But the other thing is that, so they do the visits virtually, but the dads are home. So Mm -hmm. not only do they do the visits virtually, but they do the visits virtually with the dads. And it sort of highlights, first of all, how the dads are so often left out and how their perspective is so important to understanding what's going on in family. So then we started wondering like, okay, so what are we gonna do when this is no longer the case? Are we gonna continue to marginalize dads as not being relevant (laughs) to their child's story? Or are we gonna be creative and think of some way to uh, fix this this problem that's been um, exposed. And, and there are many, many other examples of, of that, I think. 
Yeah, and 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 I've noticed in my life as well that sometimes my children's behaviour is is directly correlated with how I'm feeling as well. And I think probably a lot of parents can kind of relate to that, both mums and dads. And 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 what I've been discussing with not only podcast guests but also other dads is how how we can how we can kind of bottle up this feeling of gratitude because a lot of dads, although it's been a stressful time. It's been a it's been a period where they actually we're going through kind of a, like a reflection and introspection period. I think fathers at the moment because they've been able to in a lot of cases spend a lot more time with their children in the, than they would normally do. Um, I've heard a lot of stories of people switching off Netflix, switching off devices, doing kind of mm-hmm. puzzles, uh, tactile activities, walking in the forest, time in nature, all these kind of things that. You know, if they were doing a two-hour commute um, each day, um, they're not having the time to do. So, it's. I think it's gonna. I think there's gonna be like a sh- a shift. How we kind of bottle up that feeling going forward. I don't know how that's gonna kind of play out. It's a discussion that is kind of ongoing in the kind of the dadosphere and the manosphere, if you like, mm-hmm. as to how how we bottle that up. Because again, you know, a, a topic that comes up in discussion a lot is how our work lives have changed drastically from the kind of baby boomer generation and and in terms of the kind of the pace of life, the expectation, particularly in the corporate world where it's very much sort of if, well, if you don't want to do these hours and all these um, extra hours and unpaid overtime and all this kind of stuff, then we've got a queue of other guys that are willing to do it. And, you know, it's this kind of idea of sacrificing your soul, at the, you know, at the altar of the corporate world when, and, and and I think guys during this period are beginning to think, have I paid a price for this? And in actual fact, I didn't want to be like my dad who I never saw. How, you know, do I need to have a career rethink? Do I maybe need to be working from home some more? Some more? Um, so th- these are all things that I think are going to be grappled with in, in the next little while. And I think I think the only thing that I think that could be saddening is if we're going into a recession and it's going to cause mass hardship and people to have to really kind of knuckle down in order to survive, whether the whole, the the afterglow of lockdown is going to be lost. That's my only concern in all this, that it could be something that's forgotten very quickly. I hope not, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Uh, it's uh it's complicated <laughs> yeah it's really complicated it is <laughs> but, really complicated. yeah so i think uh you know the the optimist in me is always saying okay so this is an opportunity to get into the the messiness of things that really weren't working so well and now let it's very very fundamentally disorganizing and maybe on the other side whatever that is it can be in a in a way that is characterized by growth but mm. what you're saying is that the environment in which that growth has the potential to occur is in and of itself perhaps so stressful that it kind of overrides any opportunity for growth. So, mm. uh, yeah, I think that that's a good observation. Mm. Mm. I don't know where, yeah. where to find the optimism in that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the challenge of the corporate world. But it, well, not necessarily the corporate world. I think it's, it's, it's the kind of, it's where the, the parallels of, work dynamic versus family dynamic kind of begin to kind of clash together and it's who's going to kind of come up not come out on top of one another but it's how we kind of make that work going forward i think so um and i think probably ed with respect sir to you 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 can probably you're seeing you're you've got the benefit of seeing stuff from both generational sides of the equation Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, the, the, I'm not as optimistic as, as Claudia is. <laughs> Try as she might to, to keep me fully optimistic. The, my concern is, is sort of what you, you pointed at when you, you first brought this up, is that if you, you have, individuals have but so much resources and they gain resources from the people around them who help them to deal with things. Um, But a lot of people are going to go from the way we're going along now um, and 
pretty quickly go back when things open up, things will go back to the way they were. They won't, they'll have that two hour commute um, and they won't be able to go, you know, take the break with the kids or do, do that other kind of thing that they were doing before, unless something, something also in the environment, you know, our context really begin to change. And maybe that's more people working, you know, more people being able to work at home, different kinds of schedules. And of course, we, we know here, we talk about us essential workers, which people who really keep things going, um, their lives have, have gotten far more difficult during this period of time. Mm. You know, there are those of us who really have the luxury of being at home, feeling safe, not having to deal with things. And, you know, there may be days that I feel really flat, flattened like a pancake because it's just, it's just too big, too big a change. But there are other people who, um, you know, time has become more constricted for them and, you know, the, the context has become more frightening. Mm. So that's, that's really an issue that we, we have to begin to see and make some, and I don't know what those changes would be like, but I think those would be really important changes to get into place where people would not be under the same level of pressure that, that they're under. Mm. Mm. Interesting times. And by the way, I think the Europeans do better about this than certainly than we do. Yeah, yeah, and we're kind of in the in the UK. We're in a we're in a. I've always thought that we're kind of like the bridge between the states' way of working practices and the European way of. We're not as we're not as kind of um, family orientated as say countries like maybe France or Italy or some of the Mediterranean countries um, or even Scandinavia, but we're not not as um, we, I don't think it's uh, the working practices are the same as the US either. So there is a kind of there is a like a we're in a sort of in between ground in the in the UK where um, where it could go kind of either way because particularly where where we've come out of the European Union in terms of the kind of work the the directives around working time and that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, um, I just wanted to before I kind of bring today's conversation to a close, Ed and, uh, Ed and Claudia, I just wanted to ask you the number one thing that you want people to really kind of internalize from the message that's in your in your book. And I'll ask that, I'll, I'll say ladies first and ask the question to uh, Claudia first. Um, okay, I think it would be that to let go of a need to be perfect um, and embrace the uh, mistakes. And so not only that failure is okay, but in relation to other people. I mean, I think to put it in that relational context that when things are really problematic in, in relationships, that those are really, uh, if you hang in there and don't just try to smooth it over, that those are really opportunities for growth and if I can just have another one, <laughs> if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, sure, yeah. You can have mine. Can have mine. <laughs> <laughs> Is that when things are not going well, I mean, that's the core lesson. That's one core lesson. But the other is that if the way we are in the world is made up of millions of moment-to-moment -moment interactions over time, when things are not going well for us, there aren't like uh, one-dimensional, even two-dimensional solutions, but rather kind of immersing ourselves in a range of opportunities for mismatch and repair in all kinds of different activities and relationships Excellent. over time. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Ed, the same, <laughs> if you want me to repeat the question, Ed, I can. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I would say exactly what, what Claudia said, that if, if you can shift your focus into Allowing, allowing yourself or a framework where you, you see, uh, where you see messiness as a possibility, 
rather than something to shut down. That that it contains it's it's the sort of foundation upon which uh, growth and creating something new really comes out of it, um, and it's fundamental the, the, to the extent that one experiences um, the messiness. It it and and then is it, you're able to repair it. You're doing things in relationship, like building intimacy, and you're building trust, and um, you're building up capacity to cope with situations, and it builds resilience. It, it allows you, by having the small ones, you build up a kind of reservoir of resilience and increase your capacity for res resilience, so that when something big comes along, and we're all dealing with something pretty big now out out in the world or even, you know, even within our, our relationships. Uh, you now have the hope, as Claudia would put it, and you now have the resilience and the capacity to deal with those kinds of stresses. And something good can come out of that. Mm -hmm. And you, you can have that hopefulness about um, something new being created. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's a, it's a kind of, it's a real framework shift if, if you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it free, it frees up your own resources because you're not always fighting to contain and to hold back on things. That you now have resources to say, let's see what this is. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's see where it comes out and let's keep on seeing where it comes out. Mm. I like that. I like that a lot. And the overriding thing that I get from both of you is that it's really kind of allowing people the permission to live a life that is a little bit more messy in terms of their interaction, <laughs> their, their, their interactions with others to kind of find that, to really find that mismatch and repair. I do like it a lot. I do like it a lot. I'm going to ask you both one more question before I send you on your way. And this is a question that I ask all of the guests that come on this podcast. And I've not primed either of you on this one beforehand. So again, I'll say ladies first, Claudia, what is the, what gives you meaning in life? What gives me, um, uh, this is going to sound so corny, but I would say helping people. And in all capacities, uh, teaching people, helping my kids get through a rough moment, working with a client. Uh, yeah, I feel like I, I need need to do that <laughs> in order to survive. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I love it. And I, and I think for me, it, it is helping people, but it, it probably has a, a different... Um, it, it's doing other different other kinds of things. So for me, exploring and trying to figure out the nature of relationships and hopefully I've added uh, some, some information, some knowledge to that. Um, that kind of, that kind of thing is, is really quite, quite meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, for me, and you know, parenthetically, um, or a, a sidebar on that is when I was there was a period of I, I'm also a clinical psychologist, so there was a period of time where I was doing a fair amount of clinical work with young families, um, as well as doing the research. And in a way, I, I came to this crossroads, which was the work with families was so compelling and so demanding that it really began to limit the time that I had available to do the research. And I really had to make a decision and I made a decision about what is, what is it that where, where I can find the most meaning. Um, and 
I still do some clinical things and have, I have a, a program that Claudia and I are part of where we're working with clinicians to increase their capacity to work with people. So I sort of indirectly hope that, you know, putting tentacles out there. But I've been doing research on infants um, and maybe I'm just stuck in it, you know, for 50 years and I haven't stopped yet um, and haven't gone on to uh, something else. And I still find it really meaningful for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. And and the thing is, is the both the work that both of you do has such a massive impact as well in terms of your legacy that you're leaving on the world and the and the teachings that people can apply to their own lives as well. So I think that's what makes it the kind of the work that you're doing together. It kind of galvanizes some quite powerful messages that people can take away as well. So I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming on to speak to me today. It's been a really, really interesting conversation and, and I'm privileged to have two really bright minds talking about quite important uh, subjects and quite important concepts at this specific period in time that we're in right now. The podcast will probably go out in a couple of weeks' time, so I suspect we will put, still be in a mix in amidst this uh, this specific period of time. But um, I just wanted to ask both of you, where is the best uh, place for listeners or viewers of the podcast if they're watching it on YouTube to find out about the work you're doing, um, obviously a bit more about the power of Discord book, etc. cetera? Um, well, I, I have a website, claudiamgoldmd.com, which uh, has information about all of my books and actually has also a link to the website for the power of Discord itself. And on my uh, website, I also write regularly on my blog. Um, okay. So that's another source of right. information. Okay, cool. And I'm of a different generation. So there is the book website. And um, if people want to go to the University of Massachusetts and Boston, I have a website there. But there's really very little on it. And uh, social media, it, I like being social. Social media is not the place that I play out my socialness. No, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> perfectly fine. Guys, thanks very much for coming to speak to me today. And um, I wish you all the very best. And um, again, thanks once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>